Hello and welcome to another coding session. How about that? How about that? Today is a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, and that means today, according to the schedule, we are doing a game development. The, the same thing we did yesterday, right? So we continue to develop this game, um, which doesn't really have any name, uh, but you still can find the source code of this game in the description if you're interested. Uh, source code. There we go. So here is the source code. Uh, and on the previous episode, we started to develop a immediate UI framework for our game. Uh, yeah, so here is the previous episode. If you're interested uh, in how the immediate UI framework has started, I recommend you to watch the previous episode. Uh, episode <clears throat> um, where uh, the immediate UI framework has started. There we go. And let's take a look at what it looks like. So uh, let me actually rebuild the entire game just in case, just to ensure that everything's fine. Um, and let's start the game. Um, so we have a special debug mode. Uh, when you enter it, uh, it has two buttons. Uh, if the uh, green button is currently pressed, you can edit the tiles, right? Uh, if a uh, red button is currently pressed, you can spawn enemies. Uh, well, I mean, look and feel of the game is actually um, not not final. This is just like programmer's art. I just put whatever just to have something on the screen. Um, and yeah, so the way these buttons are rendered are it's pretty interesting. It's they're rendered in immediate style, <clears throat> and we discussed the immediate style UIs in the in the previous episode. So check out the previous episode here in the description. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at them. So I think it's somewhere UI begin. So this is where we start the tool panel. Uh, then we iterate through all of the editor tools. And for each editor tools, we create the button, uh, right? And uh, if the button was clicked, we switch to that specific editor tool. So, and then for handling the clicks on the screen, uh, we have a separate screen ID. And if the screen was clicked, uh, we do the appropriate action depending on the current tool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. One of the things I uh, didn't finish implementing yesterday is actually being able to have nested layouts because as we discussed in the previous uh, episode, we have a system of layouts like which is similar to Qt where you have horizontal boxes and vertical boxes. Uh, let's take a look at them. Uh, so it's going to be something like this. So imagine that you have uh, like a root box, which is... Um, a horizontal box that means everything you put in that box is going to be uh, aligned horizontally so and it's going to look like this i think i'm going to actually even do it like that so it everything looks more or less aligned and then i'm going to just uh, and then erase this entire thing. So you see, if you put elements inside of the blue box, uh, they're going to be aligned like that. And let's imagine that red boxes are vertical boxes. That means that everything you put in them uh, is going to be aligned vertically. So let's actually try to do something like this. So this is going to be like that. And let's imagine that we have like several of them. So this is one, this is, an, and this is another one. Right, and then we can erase this particular edge in here. And there we go. Everything we put in the red one is uh, aligned vertically. The same goes here. And that way, for example, you can have an interface with two columns, right? So you have vertical and horizontal boxes, uh, and you just combine them in some particular way. Um, right, in some particular way. Uh, and uh, one of the things we uh, we didn't implement yesterday is actually an ability to nest several boxes. Right now, there is a default box in um, when you do UI begin, right? When you do UI begin, it implicitly creates a new horizontal box, I think, uh, somewhere there, if you do begin. Uh, there we go. So it implicitly creates the horizontal box and pushes that for you. Uh, but if you want to have nested ones, you have to use begin layout and end layout. And we didn't implement any of those things. And I created a separate issue for that. So, uh, yep. Let's see if we can do that. So I would like to actually come up with an example um, so we can implement all of that. 
so for instance here we are rendering the uh, a sequence of buttons right and all of that is rendered in a horizontal box okay so let's actually wrap all of that into the uh, horizontal boxes why don't know begin layout uh, begin layout accept uh, the kind of the layout oh, right it only accepts the kind of the layout so I have to do UI uh, layout kind horizontal that's a lot of typing actually <laughs> That's a lot of typing. I have to go inside of UI, layout, kind, horizontal. And this is because, uh, yeah, all of that is located like this. Uh, so maybe if, if I used... Uh, if I used not enumeration classes, it would be a little bit easier. So I, I don't understand. Like, I'm really conflicted on C++ enumeration classes. So every time I use them, sometimes, like, it feels quite often uh, that they don't solve the problems that they're supposed to solve. <laughs> um, they solve some of the problems, but they introduce shit ton of other problems. Like, and it's, is it even worth it? I don't know. Uh, is it even worth it? So this is where we start the horizontal layout, and then... Uh, we can go ahead and end the layout. Mm. And one of the things I want to do in here... Oh, by the way, begin layout does not even support the padding. I think it should support the padding, right? Uh, because padding is one of the important things of the layout system, because you want to have a little bit of space between your elements, right? I think it's quite important. All right, so the, here's one horizontal layout, and um, maybe we can create another horizontal layout. Uh, I don't know, maybe we're going to even copy-paste it. Right, so we're going to be copy-pasting uh, these two things, and then I'm going to say, let's actually combine them in a vertical layout. Uh, something like this, begin, layout, UI, uh, layout, kind, kind, I set vertical one. There we go. So it's going to be something like this. Then I'm going to go down there uh, and wrap everything like this. Right. And then I'm going to say end layout. So as you can see, I'm sort of like describing the, the structure of the UI. At the root, we have a vertical layout. And then within the vertical layout, we have two horizontal layouts uh, and so on and so forth. So for the padding, we can use the same padding as the tools panel padding. Uh, and I'm going to put it everywhere here. Uh, tools panel. So this is going to be the other one. Tools uh, panel padding. There we go. So, yeah, this is completely unnecessary. I'm only doing that just to test the functionality of the nested layout because this mechanism will let us uh, build very complicated UIs. Um, all right. Uh, and it's quite important. It's quite important. Uh, so let me see. <clears throat> so I did a typo. So what's the next compilation error? Okay, so here uh, we also introduce the padding. So let me quickly, uh, you know, denote it here. Uh, do we have anything else? I think that's it. 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 <laughs> uh, anyway, so let's actually start the game. And if I enable the debug mode, the game should crash, saying that begin layout is not implemented. Yeah. Begin layout is not implemented. So let's try to implement that. It should be pretty straightforward. What we need to do, we just need to push and like a new layout. We need to prepare it according, uh, according to kind and padding. And yeah, it should be pretty straightforward. So first, uh, I want to create a separate branch. Uh, it's going to be 1.7. Uh, and this is precisely where we implement in all of this. Um, okay, so let's unpack our kind and our pad and let's create a new layout in here so the kind of the layout is going to be the kind that is provided by the user so the position is rather interesting the position essentially depends um, on the position of the previous layout because we have a layout stack right so if you want to uh, render an element somewhere on the screen you have to take a layout on the top of the layout stack and ask that uh, layout, what, where can I place myself in, right? So, uh, and then the, the, that layout will tell you a position and you can place yourself there. And once you place yourself there, you have to tell that same layout uh, how big you are. So the layout can extend itself, right? Um, and yeah, th that way, basically we uh, know the positions of all, all of the elements. So that means we need to actually grab the, uh, the top layout on the stack, right? 
So we have a special function called tap, top layout, which returns a pointer. And if it returns null, it indicates that um, there is no top layout. Um, and I suppose this one is rather interesting. So begin layout may not start, uh, may not start if you did not have any layout on the stack before. Uh, and that's why begin, that's why begin implicitly creates a new layout for you. Mm, okay, we can do a similar thing uh, as we do with the button. Essentially, if you uh, don't have a top layout uh, when you're trying to render the button, we're going to basically crash. I think it's kind of a similar situation. So uh, I'm going to take layout and I'm going to grab the top layout. And then I'm going to simply assert that the layout is not equal to null PTR. By the way, we're programming in C++, not in C. In C++, you're supposed to do null PTR, as far as I know. Right. So, and then once we've got that, we can uh, ask, well, we already taken the name, didn't we? Okay. Uh, so let me rename it to result. And this is going to be like this, uh, available position. So this is how you ask the previous layout, what's the available position, where can I uh, put myself in? Uh, all right, after that, uh, the size, the original size of the layout is going to be zero because we didn't add any elements in there. And the padding, the padding is going to be a pad. So after that, uh, what we're essentially doing, we're just pushing, well, this one has to be result, uh, pushing the new layout. There we go. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not really a result. I usually call results something that I return out of the function, but in here I'm not really returning it. So maybe I'm gonna call this one something like uh, previous. Well, this one has to be layout. So this is a previous, and this one is going to be next. Yeah, there we go. I think it's a way better naming in here. Yeah, yeah. it is definitely a way better naming. So this is how we uh, add a new layout. Let's try to recompile this entire thing and see if it's working and see if it's working. Uh, build the sage, there we go. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So uh, this one is a previous one. Okay, so now it will crash in end layout. Begin layout didn't crash, so uh, we just need to implement end layout. And in the end layout, we basically have to. Yeah. yeah. Um, why, do, why am I starting my paint? I already have an instance of my paint. So uh, as we e iterate through the UI tree in immediate mode, uh, we push in a pop in layouts. Uh, in and out of the stack. So here's the stack and we have a bunch of um, layouts in here, like so. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of difficult for me to draw them properly. So essentially, um, as you add more and more elements to the top layout, it gets expanded, right? So if your stack looks like this and you keep adding buttons uh, on the screen, right, you keep add, adding buttons, uh, those buttons are added into this layout and it extends, extends and extends, right. Once you're done with that specific layout, you want to pop it out of the stack. But to pop it out of the stack, you need to grab its size and tell the previous layout its size so that layout can expand. And only then you pop it out of here. And then if you want to pop it out of here, uh, you need to tell the size of this layout to the previous one. And this one is going to be bigger because of that one. And only then you're going to pop it out. You see, sort of uh, every time you pop out the layout, you tell the previous one uh, how to extend. And this is how they basically cooperate each other into uh, this sort of form. Right. So uh, as you add more and more uh, widgets, more and more layouts, the corresponding layouts expand and everything is adjusted accordingly. Um, so that's how it's going to work, essentially. Uh, <clears throat> so let me see. We have a special, I suppose, function in here, pop layout that pops the, yeah, yeah, the, that pops the current layout. I wonder if it crashes if it doesn't have a top one. Yeah, yeah it, it crashes if it doesn't have a uh, top one. Um, so how are we going to do that? So this is the layout and how I'm going to call it. Um, it's probably going to be, let's call it child, uh, pop layout. And then we're going to have something like uh, parent, 
right? And uh, for the parent, we're just uh, gonna look at it, you see? Um, so we only popping out the top one, but for the one before top one, we're only looking at it. All right, and uh, it's quite important for that thing to exist, of course. If it doesn't exist, we're doing something wrong. We're using UI in, uh, framework incorrectly. So, and essentially what I need to do, I need to push uh, widget and push widget accepts the size. And as far as I know, you can just grab the size from the child and there you go. Uh, we just created this entire thing. And as far as I know, when you end the UI, uh, we need to end the layout that was uh, added on the begin. Right, so we need to end that one. Um, so because of that, maybe it would make sense to put end layout in here rather than just popping it out. Right, it makes a little bit more sense. So I think I um, resolved all of the to-dos in here. So let me recompile this entire thing and see if we implemented something. So if we implemented something, we should be able to see uh, four buttons, essentially two rows and two columns. And it still crashed, okay. Oh, it has to be not equal to null point. Okay, very well. I mean, nothing bad really happened, but uh, I just I only embarrassed myself. That's the worst thing that happened. Um, and uh, oh yeah 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 yeah. So essentially, it makes sense. In the end, we should pop the layout because at the end we have nowhere to put uh, the size of that layout. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, I was right. I, I should have actually uh, like pop, popped it out. Okay, okay, that makes sense. All right, another one. Hopefully this time it's gonna be a success and we'll see four by four grid uh, of the buttons. And there you go. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you can basically press on any of them. <laughs> And they basically share the same ID, right? They share the same ID, and that's why they look like this. Uh, we could try to actually do something more interesting and uh, have those buttons to have their own IDs. Uh, but then we'll have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, let's say that the second row, actually the one, we started to count them starting from the bottom one, right? Because it's a, uh, OpenGL coordinates. OpenGL coordinates are minus one, one, a minus one, one. In OpenGL, Y grows up. Right, and usually in screen coordinates, Y go, goes down, right, because it's an array of pixels, but OpenGL tried, tries to be a little bit more mathematical, and that's why uh, Y uh, goes up. So that's why the second row is the one that is at the top, right? <laughs> so just something to keep in mind. Uh, let's actually make them independent from the toolbar buttons, uh, and let's create something like N, and let's say uh, we want to have five of those buttons, right? And uh, what we want to do, we want to iterate through all of these buttons, and the actual ID, uh, maybe this one is not going to be ID, it's going to be just I, but the actual ID that I want to uh, generate here is going to be I, um, rather static cast static cast uh, editor tool mm, size t editor tool uh, count plus i this way we're never going to collide with the toolbar uh, ids so they should be like they always go after the maximum possible toolbar id um, all right so here's the id uh, the button size. Mm, I think I'm gonna put something like float size in here and toolbar size. Mm -mm -mm. Let's call it debug button size. Right, so this is something like debug button size, and I'm gonna put that in the uh, in the variables. Uh, debug button size. Uh, so toolbar button size is 100. Um, but in our case, yeah, let's we'll, we'll just keep it 100 and then we're going to dynamically change it and see how it will change. Um, so this one is ID and um, if you click on any of these things, I don't see any reason to do anything at all. I don't think this should react to anything. It's just for, for testing purposes. Uh, and their color, what's going to be their color? Uh, I don't know, debug button color, right? So this is going to be something like this. Uh, debug button color. Uh, it's going to be color, let's say, it's going to be yellow. What's yellow? Is it a red plus green? I think it's a red plus green, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think it should be a red plus green. Um, all right, so that way, um, 
we have more of these things. Oh, this one is actually interesting. So we can also do something like debug button count. And do we even have integers? I think we had integers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had integers for this thing. Uh, and so I should be able to do something like this. Um, debug button uh, count. Uh, I want it count, please. Hmm. All right. So what we're going to have in here. Um, so debug button count. Uh, yeah, so this one is integer, but this one is uh, an um, unsigned integer. So we have to do some, something like static. You know what? Maybe I can actually make it int. Uh, and then as we... Yeah. Will that compile? Because I feel like I will have to cast uh, i to there as well. So I forgot a semicolon somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so here's the extra parenthesis in here. Um, is it going to compile? I think it's going to compile. All right. And as you can see, now we have five buttons at the top. You can click them, but they do nothing, right? Because we don't really handle them at all. Uh, but we do handle these two. And what's interesting is that because the parameters of these buttons are well, sort of like updated uh, updated dynamically, uh, there should be controllable why the configuration file so let's say i want to say that i'm going to have uh, 10 buttons now and th now i have a 10 buttons <laughs> uh what if i have two of them uh now i have two and then i have five and of course at any point i can change their colors you know what's interesting is that if the ui was a retained ui this kind of stuff wouldn't be possible Right, because in case of a retained UI, you create the UI tree up front. That way you solidify what your UI needs to be. And making this hot reloading stuff like that becomes very, very difficult, right? Because every time you hot reload the thing, you have to scrap the current UI tree um, and build a new one. But here, I don't have to scrap anything. I just have a bunch of runtime parameters according to which I generate this UI every frame. So there's nothing to scrap and reload. This is freaking genius. This simplifies everything. Uh, I absolutely love it. Like, I would never be able to come up with the idea of immediate UI myself. Like, whoever came up with it is a freaking genius. Like, holy fucking shit. Yeah, so if I had it, like, in, uh, you know, retained UI style, um, I wouldn't be able to do this kind of shit. And I certainly wouldn't be able to do, I don't know, this kind of shit where I could say that the buttons are bigger now. Um, so, yeah. And if automatically everything, like the, the layouting is, um, you know, recalculated and stuff like that. So it's actually pretty cool. Holy fucking shit. Uh, and then you can have 10 of them, but they're gonna go over the screen. But yeah, no. Uh, hmm. That is goddamn fucking cool. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yep, that's very cool. Uh, so as you can see, we already can build some relatively complicated shit. Um, but one of the things we're missing uh, is probably, I feel like there's like not enough interactions with the buttons. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, so as I already mentioned in the previous stream, I experimented why, with my own immediate UI library. Uh, you can find the source code in the description. I'm going to put it in the description. Mm -hmm. So yeah, here it is. And uh, okay, um, immediate UI experiment my immediate UI experiment. <clears throat> so let's, let's take a look at that uh, specific experiment. So there, so far, I created a bunch of buttons. All right. So do I need to fetch the latest stuff for this thing? Uh, fetch prune origin. <clears throat> so I want to rebuild everything just in case. All right, so here I have a bunch of buttons, and you see, uh, when you hover over the button, over the button, it actually highlights a little bit, and when you press it, it changes its color. Uh, and this is not, you know, a fancy feature just to look fancy. No, no, no. This kind of behavior actually has a practical implication. So essentially, if you hover over uh, an element and it highlights, it tells the user that you can interact with it. 
If it doesn't highlight in any way, uh, the user may not even guess that you can click on that thing. So it is quite important for interactable elements to be highlighted because this is a part of an um, intuitive UI. In UI basically tells the user how you can use it. Okay, so you hover over it and, and the UI says, hey, user, you can click on me. And this is how user knows that uh, they clicked on it. So, and then when you click on this thing, it changes the color. Um, and uh, you didn't unpress this entire thing and it wouldn't change its color back until you unpress it. So the, the reason why buttons behave like that, I, I think, is because this action should be cancelable, right? So you see, basically, uh, by changing the color, the button tells, okay, I'm about to perform the action. Do you really want to perform it? And you confirm that you want to perform that action by unpressing the button. If you are, if you don't want to perform that action, you basically go out of the button, unpress it, and as you can see, action was not registered. Right, so here, if you unpress it while hovering over the button, the action was registered. But if you unpress it while being outside of the button, it's not uh, activated. So this is actually something that people don't even notice when they uh, interact with the UI. This is like, yeah, it's like the, the second nature. This is how UI works. But there's a lot of interesting implications behind this like UI decisions, highlighting, uh, changing the color, uh, and actually registering the action when you unpress the button rather than immediately. So this kind of stuff allows you to cancel this entire thing. This kind of stuff tells you that you can interact with it and so on and so forth. So, and this is something that our UI in our game kind of lacks. And I think it is important uh, for practical implications. If the if our UI will become more and more complicated, it will be difficult to tell which elements are interactive and which ones are not. Uh, so I think the UI should be, you know, um, should be capable of explaining how to use itself, right? So if you can interact with them, something it, it highlights, um, right? And then some of the actions needs to be cancelable. That's why they have to be registered on Unpress. So, and this is something that, that, that I would like to work on um, after we uh, made a pull request for, for, the, for the issue that we just fixed. Um, right, so. <clears throat> and I, I think I want to make a small break because I, again, yet again, didn't make a cup of tea. Uh, so, yeah, I need a little bit of coffee. In, and after I have my tea, uh, we're going to try to um, commit whatever we have and make this element interactive. So, uh, yeah, let's make a small break. And all right. So let's do a commit to commit of this entire thing and work on the interactiveness. Uh, okay, um, I think I'm gonna actually keep the debug buttons just in case. Uh, you know what, we can actually quite easily enable or disable this kind of stuff. So we don't want to like commit that into like production, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, debug button uh, enabled. Um, do we have booleans in here? I think we should be able to have booleans, right? So, and uh, depending on whether this entire thing is enabled or disabled, we're gonna show or not show the buttons. And again, with immediate UI, it's actually super easy to implement. And we, we don't have a we don't have a boolean type apparently in our configuration. So let's actually quickly implement that. You know, uh, so we have a pretty cool system where we can pile new types into the config configuration just on top. So, and uh, yeah, let's quickly do that. So I'm gonna go to the config definition and here are all the types. So here are all the types that we support in the configuration, float, color, integer, and string. And let's introduce the boolean, right? And as soon as you introduce the boolean, that will trigger a bunch of compilation errors in the entire code base and we're going to go through them and by the end we're going to have um you know a new type in the configuration so let's quickly do that okay so here's a bunch of things uh so here uh yeah we need to update this union uh as bool there we go uh what's going to be the next thing so here we updated everything accordingly uh what's the next stuff so when we're printing this thing we need to print it accordingly right so basically we are serializing the the type uh the the value of the enumeration that denotes the type uh all right what's going to be the next one so this is how we generate generating the uh, the actual C code. Yeah, here's an interesting thing about the, this configuration file, is that uh, we generate C code 
based on this configuration file. Uh, right, so index, I think, yeah, this is what we, well, I mean, we, we have nothing to generate because we failed to compile. But essentially the way this entire hot reloading system works is because we generate a little bit of the C code based on that config and that's how we can easily reload that config at runtime. Uh, so this is actually a pretty cool system. Um, anyway, so let's continue going through this entire stuff and the way we generate the code is going to be the following uh, config type right i just need to generate a specific field uh, print ln okay std out const boolean right because it's a boolean then we take uh, config value uh, definitions and then we take the name of the variable right and then we say that it has to be equal to config values a uh -huh, as boolean right as boolean and then we need to put a semicolon here and i wonder if println actually prints booleans correctly let me see so print one uh file stream uh bool Okay, so we have a, okay, we actually print them correctly. Okay, perfect. I really like that. Um, this is something that standard C++ library doesn't do for some reason. I, I really don't know why, right? If you take a look uh, at the standard C++ library, specifically like IO streams and whatnot, uh, right? Something like that. Right, if you try to print uh, actual Boolean, right? True or false? Um, G plus plus main CPP uh, O main and then if we're gonna run it as you can see it's gonna be printed as one and zero. I don't know why C++ has enough information enough uh, functionality to actually detect that you're trying to print boolean and not integer and essentially print true or false correspondingly. I have no idea why is it trying to do it like that. So uh, in the contrast, uh, contrast in our uh, library, it's HPP, uh, right, you also have to define its implementation because it's a STB style uh, header only library. If you never heard about STB style header only libraries, I really recommend to check it out. Um, so yeah, in the original repo with um, STB libraries, there is an explanation um of what this library implementation macro means so i'm gonna put the link uh to that in the description just in case you're curious about this kind of stuff uh stb uh, stbs uh implementation implementation macro uh right there we go uh it's gonna be in the description uh right and then you want to print uh, something like true all right or false right true or false and if you try to recompile this entire thing uh, it's actually located in src and of course <laughs> uh, uh oh yeah i do remember because it's located in aids yeah, yeah so c out uh, is located in std and our println is located in aids okay so that that makes sense uh and there we go so also you have to actually compile with uh std C++ 17 to get rid of the warnings and there you go now it's true or false if you want to print them as one and zero you just put one and zero in there correspondingly again C++ has enough functionality to actually dispatch dispatch the types appropriately at compile time and I have no idea why the standard C++ library doesn't just take advantage of that it's, it's kind of weird to me it's kind of sus uh, so yeah that's everything I wanted to say about the topic <laughs> sorry uh so let's see um yeah and because of that we can just print it as it is so uh config value devs uh, name so what is it talking about config uh value is not declared but i oh config value devs underscore okay it's a single thing okay i really need to update my um my glasses uh, this statement may fall through. Thank you for reminding me about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very useful compiler. Okay, now uh, this is how we convert a particular a particular type to a name. So the name of this type is going to be boolean. Uh, next error. Um, all right. 
So then we're parsing, we're parsing the type by its name. So let me increase this thing. Uh, and in here, uh, I need to do something like Boolean. Uh, Boolean, there we go. Mm, I think this is the last one. And this is how we actually take the text and converting that text to um, to a type, to a particular value of a particular type. So case config, uh, config boolean, um, config type boolean, right. So, and if, um, I think I need to use in namespace aid in here. If value SV uh, is equal to true, right, we instantaneously return uh, true and we also I guess we need to set the result as boolean to true there we go uh, now if value is equal to false we set the result uh, to false and we say that we successfully uh, parse this entire thing otherwise we say that we didn't successfully parse it uh, I guess that's it. This is how we parse uh, booleans in our system. Um, should be pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you can see now, it doesn't it doesn't fail uh, compilation. And this is the code that got generated from our configuration file. Right. So essentially, we generated value definitions. Uh, so the runtime now knows each individual name of the variable and its type. And we also generated array of uh, possible config values. And we also generated macros that redirect to the corresponding cells in this array according to their types. So this is basically the code we are generating from the vars conf. Right, so this is basically what we do. And now we, um, as you can see, support booleans, right? Debug buttons enabled, it's it's boolean, you can you can actually use that. It's pretty, it's pretty convenient. So, and what I can do now, I can go into the game, uh, right? And essentially put all of that under the condition. If debug uh, button enabled, it was it buttons? Yeah, it was buttons enabled only then render that piece of layout if it's not enabled don't render it so and by default as you can see it is false let's see how it's going to work um so should we pretty step forward <laughs> so if i run this entire thing and uh, i enable as you can see we don't have a debug buttons but now if we go to uh, the configuration file and we say that now we have debug buttons here they are and i can now play with them i can make them smaller or right so something like this um you, you can barely see them here you can barely see them but they are uh, they're there uh i can make them super big like 400 in here uh and then if i'm done playing with them i can just disable them and they're never going to be rendered so yeah that's pretty convenient um so all right um let's let's commit that so here's the definition and um Mm -mm -mm -mm. I guess we basically implemented the yeah we implemented the uh, issue that we were trying to implement 107 and what 107 says uh, does not support nested layout um, <clears throat> I have too many games running right now um, mm -mm -mm. add support for nested layouts uh, UI layouts uh, let me see if I have any to-dos. I think I didn't introduce any additional to-dos. That's actually fine. All right, so and let me push that right into the repo. Okay, good. And we're gonna close this entire thing. Okay, so we need to wait until continuous integration is done. So let's quickly uh, jump to continuous integration being finished. And it's done. Okay, so let's merge this entire thing. Uh, everything seems to be uh, done. So uh, let's try to make our buttons a little bit more interactive. So uh, specifically, um, let's see if we can make them highlight when you hover over them. 
right so let me fetch the latest stuff so let's remove all this garbage it's not needed anymore and i'm gonna go to the master and fetch the latest thing uh, merge origin master there we go uh cool so maybe i should create like a separate um issues for that but eh whatever uh into uh, UI uh, highlight. Let's actually call it UI highlight, the, the, the branch where we're gonna work on that. And let's see what we can do about all of that. As far as, as I know, right, so we keep track of the active button in the UI, right? So it's gonna be somewhere here. Mm, 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 mm. here is an active button so to support highlights we need to introduce another kind of like state or like id that we need to keep track of and this is hot id right the hot uh widget is the widget with which you are about to interact right so uh if the button if you are about to interact with the button it highlights right so again if we take a look at this example um yeah, I have a button and I'm about to interact with this button and that's why it is highlighted. You can clearly see that it highlights every time I'm about to interact with it. So any button, if I'm about to interact with it, it highlights, right? And here I'm about to actually uh, make an action and that's why it is active, right? And when I press it, it becomes inactive, but it also generates a click and uh, then you can do some actions based on that specific click. So uh, they are hot. This button is hot, this button is active, it's an active and a generated click. Pretty straightforward. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and introduce this entire thing. So it's gonna be hot ID. So, and of course, by default, you may not have anything that is hot, right? You may not have anything that is hot and you may not have anything that is active. Um, all right, so that means we have to change the logic of the buttons, right? So we have to change the logic of the buttons. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me see. The first thing we do in the button, we get the top layout and we confirm that it does exist because if it doesn't exist, we have no place for the button to be placed. Um, so then we uh, construct the rectangle of the button and then we start keeping track a track of the uh, of the button being pressed or not. Okay, if the button is active, it is active, uh, and mouse button is unpressed, and the mouse position is within the rectangle, uh, we um, essentially uh, make the bat button inactive, so this is not an active button anymore, and we generate in a click. Okay, so uh, otherwise, if we're not active, right, um, and the mouse actually mm -mm -mm. we're not active and nobody else is active i suppose yeah, yeah. nobody else is active so th this logic is probably invalidated because it, it, was, it wasn't taking into account the hot elements right uh so if we are not active and nobody else is active nobody else is active and Mm, the mouse is within uh, the mouse is within the button right mm -mm. the mouse is within the button oh man this one is hard uh, okay so I just trying to reinvent the thing that I did in my original UI um, I suppose we can check for being hot yeah I think we can check for being hot in here. Uh, all right, so let me remove that. We check whether we're active. Okay, so we're not active. What if we are hot, right? Uh, hot ID, some ID. So if we're hot and uh, the mouse button uh, is pressed and it is pressed within the rectangle, uh, we should become active within the rectangle and um to be fair we don't need to check that we are within the rectangle if we became hot that means we're 100 within the rectangle okay so mouse button is pressed and uh nobody else is active nobody else is active we become active right we essentially become active uh so it's going to be equal to some id and that does not generate a click yet uh, otherwise um, 
we're not active we know that for a fact uh we're not hot we know that for a fact um so the think uh contains mouse position so the button is within the mouse position um <clears throat> and nobody else is hot uh, has value we become hot right. hot id equal sum id i guess that's basically the logic so first we check are we active are we active if we are active mouse button is impressed and we're within the button we become in um inactive to be fair mm, i think it should be actually reorganized like this it doesn't take into account the situation when you want to uh cancel the the um, cancel the click right if button is impressed we become inactive regardless whether it's within the uh the rectangle or not but if it was within rectangle right if it was within rectangle we do generate the click right we do generate the click okay so that makes sense if we're active mouse button is impressed we become inactive and if it was within the rectangle we generate the click and if it was uh, was outside of the rectangle we do not generate the click right so you can clearly see it uh here right so if i unpress this thing uh while being inside it generates the click but when if if i'm outside it doesn't generate it so this is precisely the logic that lets us to cancel this kind of this kind of thing all right so <clears throat> all right we are inactive but we're hot right and uh if we're hot and mouse button is pressed while we're being hot and nobody else is currently active nobody else is currently active we become active um right but do we actually cancel being hot mm, maybe we can also cancel being hot um uh, yeah because we're we're not hot anymore I suppose yeah, because we're not hot anymore so maybe it has to be something like has false there we go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe we should actually occupy both of these things it's 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 actually kind of strange okay uh so we become active but we're still being hot we hot and active All right so if we are um not hot and not active uh the mouse is within the uh the rectangle and nobody else is hot we become hot right and here maybe uh when we generated a click when we unpressed we actually set both hot and active to false right because as the button goes through uh, the the states hot and active it basically grabs both of the slots uh hot and active so yeah i guess that's basically what happened what happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that means i should be able to switch between these things i think i should not have that stuff yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we are active mouse button is impressed we become inactive uh and if it was within that okay if we are hot mouse button uh, is pressed and nobody else is active we become active uh if we are not active and not hot and this thing is within uh the stuff will become active uh though that means that while something is currently active while something is currently active as we move around it will actually highlight the rest of the buttons so to prevent this highlighting of the rest of the buttons while we've been active and dragging around i think uh we should check that we're not active or that nobody is active right now uh right so it does not exist okay so all right i think that's uh that's a pretty good a good thing um and now we also need to be able to render ourselves differently depending on whether we're currently active or inactive right so and how we're going to be able to do that we have the base color 
right we have the base color maybe we should modify that color depending on whether we're active or inactive or something like that right so here uh yeah we have the color and uh here we switch to hot and as we switch to hot we can update our color maybe make it a little bit um you know brighter right a little bit brighter uh, or maybe like invert the colors or something like that. So how can we make it slightly brighter? How can we make it slightly brighter? Well, uh, we can just increase all of the components in the button, RGBA components, um, excluding probably alpha, right? So we probably don't want to touch alpha. Uh, so this is going to be R and it's going to be something like, uh, we have to be super careful with this thing, plus uh, it's a value, it's a normalized value from 0 to 1, so we can increase it by, we can call it something like UI um, highlight, um, is it offset, is it rather offset, we can call it um, UI highlight. Yeah, let's, let's call it UI highlight. And uh, after that, you want to actually grab a minimum between that and one because you don't want to oversaturate it, right? So, and essentially you're going to have three of these things and uh, then we're going to create a replace R with G uh, and then R with B. There we go. So this is how we're going to do that. So this is how we highlight the thing being hot. And if it's activated, we can, I don't know, invert the color at the top. <laughs> this is one of the things we can do. Uh, is it possible to just invert the color within this thing? Um, I think it should be possible. So let's do something like RGBA invert. Uh, this is going to be const. And what we want to return in here, we want to return RGBA uh, minus R uh, minus G uh, minus B. And this one is going to be alpha. So it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, right. So in that particular case, we're going to say the color is equal to color uh, that is inverted. And there we go. So yeah, when the element is hot, it's going to be slightly highlighted based on UI highlight. Um, and if you holding it and clicking it, it's going to be the colors are going to be inverted, right? So it's not going to be super pretty, um, but it's just going to be something that indicates the user that something is happening because right now we don't even have anything, right? So the user doesn't even know that something may happen. Um, okay. So let's try to compile this entire thing, and I think it's not going to compile because it doesn't know about UI highlight. Um, all right, so uh, what do we have in here? Um, so what are you ranting about? So this is not F, it's, it has to be just A. Okay, we're propagating A. Um, okay, do we have anything else? UI highlight. Okay, so I'm going to add UI highlight to the uh, to the configuration in here. Okay, reload, reload it. Um, so let's put like this UI highlight and it's going to be a float and I suppose it's going to be something like zero one, right? So let's just keep it like zero one. <clears throat> all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, okay. So if I try to run this entire thing and, uh, it is not working. Well, At least it's trying to do something. I wonder if the uh, this is because the highlight is too small. Let's actually try to increment it. Uh, yeah, you, you, you cannot see anything. So the logic is definitely busted uh, somehow. One more time. One more time. If the element is active, right? If the element is active uh, and mouse button isn't pressed. Hmm. I think the modifications to uh, to this stuff has to be done somewhere here. Yeah, you see, if you are hot, you render yourself like that, right? You render yourself like that, but it's gonna yeah, it's gonna generate like a lag of one frame, but eh, it's it's totally fine, I suppose, right? If you're um, if you're active, you invert the color and then maybe you switched on the next frame to a different state. Uh, if you're uh, hot, you do that, but maybe on the next frame you're going to switch to something else um, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. All right, I think it starts to make sense. Uh, let's see if it's going to work now. So it's going to build dot sh and... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
All right, it's it gets highlighted. It gets highlighted, but now it's just okay. Mm. So it stays. If I go outside of the screen, oh, I know why. I even know why. Because I think screen should also be able to become hot. Right, screen should, screen should also be able to become hot. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. So we have a notion of the screen in here, right? Uh, if you are active. Uh, and mouse button is in press, you become that and you generate a click. Uh, otherwise, if you're hot, um, I don't think you need to generate anything. Right. Because you're always inside of the screen. Here's the problem. You're always inside of the screen, so it doesn't doesn't really help um so <clears throat> if <clears throat> all right if mouse button <clears throat> So I'm thinking who has to be re uh, responsible for this kind of stuff. We can say that maybe if rectangle um, does not contain a mouse position anymore, if you're hot, but the uh, thing, the mouse is not within your rectangle, uh, you're not hot anymore, right? So you're basically leaving this entire thing for, for somebody else. It's gonna be like something like false. Um, mm -hmm. um, then has value. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, if the mouse is pressed and nobody else is active, uh, you become active. Okay, so is it going to work now? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, it highlights uh, and all right huh that's very interesting so <laughs> uh, at least there is some sort of interaction in here there is some sort of interaction so let's take a look at the buttons uh the debug buttons now um uh, let's take a look at the debug buttons so we're gonna quickly enable them it's gonna be true uh, and uh yeah they get highlighted and yeah this is actually yeah this is actually way better uh -huh. you can interact with them they are too big uh, actually, i actually want to make them a little bit smaller uh there we go so and unfortunately you cannot control the padding right so if you make them super small uh the padding is like like very big for them uh so i wonder if we can also make you know the padding a little bit uh, better uh okay uh, all right. So to be fair, I'm not even sure if uh, this kind of stuff should be cancelable, if you know what I mean, because these are not really conventional buttons, right? So because the conventional buttons are like uh, performed in action. But here, it's not really a, a single button that is a widget. It's actually a sequence of a button, right? Because you have, you basically switch in between different elements. So maybe they should react instantaneously as you, you press them, uh, but I'm not sure, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but overall, it seems to be working. So these debug buttons, uh, let's actually disable them. Right. And I kind of want to focus on this stuff. So we need a better colors for, um, for the tool buttons, because right now, it like looks kind of weird to be fair. Um, <clears throat> um, and it would be also better if we're gonna just modify the colors, it would be better to modify them in uh, HSL space, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, right, because in HSL space, you modify in hue, satur saturation and lightness or value or something like that. And if you wanna make something brighter, you change the lightness or value and um, then playing with saturation we can also maybe 
if the button is active we make it we can make it more saturated and controlling the brightness and saturation in uh, rgb space is kind of difficult so yeah maybe we should introduce like a new type uh, right so let me let me see we, we do have rgb right and uh, we can probably try to introduce a class that is called uh, hsl right and uh, just store everything in hsl in that case, it's probably going to be HSL A, right? Because we also want to preserve the alpha. Uh, so, and then inside of the RGB, you can have something like uh, two HSL, HSL A, HSL A. I don't know where I want this thing. Right, this thing does not modify the original one. Um, right, and so once you render the UI, um, right, we convert RGB to HSLA uh, and just do corresponding uh, transformations and whatnot. Uh, maybe. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see. So first I want to actually commit whatever we have in, in here. Uh, so I wonder if it still works with the screen stuff. Let me see if it works with the screen stuff. So this is the wrong one. Uh, right, so I press these things, nothing changing, but I can still press this kind of stuff, and it seems to be uh, working relatively great. Okay, that's cool. That is cool, and you can clearly see you can interact with these things. I really like that. Yeah, you, you can clearly see you can interact with that. Mm -hmm. And then you can cancel this entire stuff. Alrighty, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So let's fix the colors of the buttons. Let's make them a little bit more, uh, you know, interesting or at least make them make more sense <laughs> because right now colors are really strange. Uh, all right. Introduce the notion of a hot widget in UI. Right, and let's push that right into the repo. <clears throat> so where do we store the colors of those things? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we could also do something more interesting, right? Uh, so in this example, right, the buttons are like a little bit three-dimensional. As you can see, they sort of offset and they're rendered as two rectangles, right? So you can see that they're rendered as two rectangles. There's uh, the base one, which is completely behind, and there's the uh, front one, which is slightly offset, right? So, and when the button is active, there is no offset between them. Um, I wish I could show you super quick, but yeah, there we go. So as you can see, if it's active, there is no offset in there um completely all right so maybe we can do something something similar but uh, if we're gonna do that route i think uh the pressed button the pressed button in the toolbar the activated one should be sort of pressed yeah it should look like it's pressed or something um <clears throat> yeah that would be actually rather interesting hmm. mm, so yeah i'll think how to implement that a little bit later um, mm. So did they commit everything? I think I committed everything. So where do we keep uh, our colors? Where do we keep our colors? Uh, I think we had a function. We had we had a specific function that maps the editor toolbar to its color. Yes, yes, yes. So we have something like this. Um, mm. I need to I need to think what can be the best color for this kind of stuff. I also need I think I'm gonna make a small break just uh, super quick because I want to refill my uh, my cup of water. Uh, okay, let's implement HSL. Uh, so uh, RGBA. So since we're gonna have like several color representations, I think it would make sense to turn this module into. Uh, rename this module into something like color instead of RGBA, right? So maybe we're going to have more of these kind of things. Um, so this one has to be renamed to cola. There we go. All right, and let's see how miserably the entire source code is going to fail if we're going to try to compile this thing. All right, so this is the cola. Uh, anything else? Mm. Okay, so instead of this thing, 
uh, we also have to call it color. You know what's interesting is that I just seen in the um, in the config definition, uh, color is specifically RGBA. Since we're starting to have uh, like different representations of the colors, maybe this thing should be renamed to RGBA. Uh, so we can actually put it to doing here. Um, okay, config type uh, color should be probably renamed to config type uh, RGBA because we uh, introduced uh, HSL colors. Um, so for different uh, types of um, colors, uh, color representations, it would make sense to have separate types, right? Because uh, we don't want to actually convert uh, all of the color representations to a single color representation, because as, as, as far as I know, uh, as you convert between different color representations, you actually lose information. So yeah. If you have color in a particular representation, it's better to like keep it in that representation for as long as possible, uh, and convert it to something else when it's actually needed to display on to show on a display or something like that. So that's why I want to have a separate tab and uh, you know a store representations separately. Um, all right. So what do we have in here? Uh, RGBA is called color. Um, I know nothing about color, by the way. <laughs> so. I know that there is like RGBA and HSL, and that's about it. But the actual theory, like mathematical theory behind all of that, like it's just like, I don't know. So I probably don't know what I'm talking about, sorry. Uh, okay, so UI highlights. Uh, we already actually made it highlight. So, well, I mean, we're still in the scope of highlighting things. So that should be fine. Uh, projectiles. All right, so let's do a committee committee of this thing. Uh, rename something RGBA to something color, right? And let's push that right into the repo. And let's go back to the color. Uh, so what do we have in here is this specific structure. And what I'm thinking is that uh, let's create a similar one, which is called HSL. Uh, do I want to preserve A? Uh, maybe I do. We'll see. We'll see. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna keep it like that, and we're gonna have H S L A. Uh, so here are the components, and we're gonna have a default constructor for this thing. Um, not defined, but default one. So I'm just basically going through through this entire thing. Um, okay. So we also want to be able to construct it from a single. Well, to be fair, it makes sense for RGBA. Right, it makes sense for RGBA, but constructing things like that for HSL doesn't really make much sense. So <laughs> I think I'm not going to do that. Uh, all right, so RGBA, uh, HSL, uh, float H. Mm, you know what? I'm going to actually copy paste it like that and use a little bit of Emacs magic. A little bit of Emacs magic. Boom. Can your Vim do that? Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm in a streaming clown mode. Um, so this is really strange. Like, what the hell is going on? Why can't I? Do I really have to just do something like that first? Yeah, yeah, okay, I, apparently I had to. Uh, but at least it makes it easier to use multiple cursors, cursors to do something like this. There we go. Um, all right, so... Mm -mm -mm. And I suppose that's going to be it for now. But the other thing we need to be able to do, we need to be able to do something like HSL to HSLA, right? And it's going to be const. And uh, what we're doing essentially in here is construct. To be fair, no, we don't really need to convert it to um, HSLA unless we want to have a specific color in RGB representation and then use it for HSLA. Uh, I think the most common operation is going to be converting HSLA to RGB. So I think it's going to be even like more common uh, than this. So I'm going to return RGBA to uh, RGBA and it's going to be const and this one is not implemented yet. Uh, we're going to implement that a little bit later. So it would be also nice to have a print function for this thing. Uh, print one file uh, stream hsla uh, hsla. Uh, yep. Uh, 
Can I just copy paste this entire thing and just go here, uh, right, like this, and instead of HS, uh, RGBA, we're gonna use HSLA, boom. Uh, and that works actually worked uh, way better than I expected. Um, H S L A, right, and all of them are floats. Um, cool, nice. Maybe because of that, because of that, uh, when I'm doing H S L A, uh, when I'm doing the UI, I want to actually accept colors in H S L A rather than R G B because I'm going to be modifying all of that, right? Uh, and yeah, I, I guess that's what we need to do. Here. Let's actually accept L S H S L A. Uh, this is going to be the color, and that will actually trigger a lot of compilation errors that we'll have to resolve at some point somehow. Mm, and let's go ahead and do that, I suppose. Um, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. It actually depends on how we convert an HSLA to RGB. Okay, so let's actually go through compilation errors and, and see how it, how it will go. Uh, so to do didn't work properly for some reason. I don't know why. Panic was not declared. Oh, I know what the hell is going on. So I have to do, actually do AIDS in here. Uh, right, I have to do AIDS. That seems to be working. Uh, and here is the color. Okay, so... Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. I see. And the color is taken from the editor tool color. Okay, so if I go here, we know that the editor tool uh, is going to be passed to UI, so maybe it makes sense to actually call it HSLA. Uh, right, and inside of the game... Um, I'm going to put it like this, so this one is HSLA, uh, and in here um, it's actually kind of interesting, so we're going to return it here. We also need to decide how, uh, like what hue, how hue is actually represented. As far as I know, hue is basically like an angle, right, in HSLA, like circle or something, I, I don't know. Uh, so in Emote Gem, we have a pretty cool filter. Uh, so if you never heard about Emote Jam, so I really recommend to, to check it out. I'm going to put it in the description. So it's my website uh, that basically takes a static image and turns it into BTTV animated emote. Uh, it can also work with the new Twitch animated emotes and stuff like that. And we have a filter called Pride. Right. It basically, it uses HSLA uh, and it just scrolls through the H. Uh, over time and space, right? And this is how it, it basically it's basically implemented. So, and the function that converts HSLA to RGB, I actually stole it from the internet. So I think I'm going to stole it from here yet again. Um, okay, so here's the emote gem, right? And of course, this entire thing is open source. You can find the source code in here in the corner. Um, all right, so let me take a, a quick look uh, at this thing. So it's done in a shader as far as I know. So it's going to be emote gem and um, so it's one of the filters. Let me find the pride emote uh, the filter. So here is the function HSL to RGB. So and we are essentially, uh, so this is a time this one is rather interesting. So we're not clamping H to anything, right? We're not clamping H, which makes me believe that it's probably maybe uh, 360 or something like that. Mm, so I don't even know. It doesn't look like it's 360. Maybe it's something else. So it's a time, but it can actually overflow in here. As you can see, it can actually overflow. So uh, we'll multiply, it, multiply it by six. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. This one is rather interesting. So what I want to do, I want to grab this entire thing and basically port it to C++ without even trying to understand that. So which is a probably bad idea, but I mean, I'm stupid. What do you want from me? Uh, all right. So this is where uh, I want to actually have it implemented. So here we have uh, RGB. Mm, this is going to be RGBA. This is RGBA. Uh, and basically this entire thing sort of works over uh, over a three-dimensional vector. That's what it does. It just works over a three-dimensional vector. Maybe we should actually start representing our colors as um, three or four-dimensional vectors to just have all of the separations defined for us. That would be actually kind of nice. Uh, 
Mm -hmm, but we only have two dimensional vectors, so we need to imp implement three dimensional ones. I don't want to do it right now. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll have to like uh, carefully just go over all of the uh, all of the components right now. And yeah, so maybe it would make sense to have a to do for that. Um, so, uh, represent colors as three four uh, dimensional dimensional uh, did I spell dimensional correctly dimensional yes I did uh, dimensional vectors um, to enable the mathematical uh, vector operations right to enable mathematical vector operations uh, maybe it would make sense to actually put that near here right something like this Mm -hmm. So just to, just as a reminder, why exactly I need all of that? <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. This one is really strange. So you take C, multiply it, and then you add vector in here. But X is not a vector, isn't it? Uh, that is really strange. Um, Hmm. Mm, so then we're clamping this entire thing. Uh, this is an absolute value. So this is a mod. Uh -huh. And within the mod, plus, why does it work? Because I would expect the C to be C.x to be a single component. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, I see, I see how it works. So if you add scalar to a vector, I suppose it adds that scalar to each individual component of the vector. This is how it works in JLSL, right? <laughs> I suppose this is how it works. Uh, okay, that probably makes sense. <clears throat> so, and... Um, okay, and now in here we have some, some other stuff. Uh, I suppose you need to start, like, uh, encoding this from here all right so and this is going to be like the final uh rgb thing so rgb uh result all right so initially it's zero uh result um r is going to be zero right uh, it's going to be zero then g is going to be four um i think it is going to be 4 and result B is going to be 2 and the result A uh, is going to be the um, the A, right? Because we basically store, store the A like that. Okay, so uh, we did that. After that, I need to take uh, the CX and I suppose CX is H, right? So I take H and multiply it by six and I need to add that to each individual component in this specific vector. So maybe I can do it actually like this, All right? So it's going to be plus like this. There we go. Um, cool. And then I do mod on six, right? So this is the mod on six. So I think in this case, I have to do something like F mod F, right? Uh -huh. and it's going to be six uh -huh. and of course this thing has to be actually floats float literals mm -hmm. uh, all right so after that i need to subtract three i need to subtract three so let's quickly do that uh, through f and then take an absolute value of this entire thing right uh okay f a b s f i think that is going to work cool uh absolute value is taken and then we're subtracting one from this entire thing mm -hmm. and then we need to clamp uh between zero and one uh do i have clamp in eights Right, so I do have clamp and it accepts low and high. So the first element is the thing that we're clamping and then low and high. So it's going to be clamp, uh, clamp, there we go. Uh, and here, zero, one, go. And all of that has to be, of course, F. 
Cool. Um, let me take a look at the original one. I think the original one was filters. Uh, yep, 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 yep. So basically, I translated this specific code to C++. It would be kind of better if this kind of stuff was done on GPU in a shader. Uh, but right now, our engine does not allow to just set HSL. But yeah, I think we need to rethink our engine yet again to allow like different color representations. And uh, the color representations will be converted in the shader, so we don't spend time on that on the CPU. That would be actually kind of cool. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool that for UI, it, it's better to have HSL because for UI, you just have base colors, and then you modify those base colors uh, um, accordingly. If you want to highlight something, you can increase brightness and you, you want to indicate something, you can shift the hue or something like that. So for UI, it is better to have HSLA. Um, for some other purposes, for rendering on the screen, it's better to have RGBA, right? So uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'm learning things. I'm actually learning things. All right, so and uh, the next uh, string uh, that we wanted to translate to C uh, is going to be this thing. So I suppose effectively what we do in here, we just, yeah, we translated hue into into RGB and then we'll have to, uh, you know, adjust the brightness and whatnot. Uh, okay, so after that, I'm taking RGBA minus 0.5. Um, okay. Mm, and then multiply it by absolute value of this thing. Um, mm -hmm. That's very interesting, actually. That's very interesting. So I suppose something like this could be a separate value by itself. I don't really know what to call it, uh, but we can try to call it something. Mm -mm. Uh, so it's going to be something like that. Um, it's going to be float, probably const float. Uh, let's call it t, right? So it's essentially one minus absolute value of two multiplied by z, which is probably l, uh, right, minus one, right? So that's basically the value. And what we're doing in here, we're just taking these things um, and subtracting them accordingly. Um, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So result r, I don't think it makes sense to actually copy paste this thing twice. Mm -hmm. So, and what I'm doing here is subtracting this. So this is precisely why I wanted to have like <laughs> vector operations on the color, so I don't have to expand these mathematical expressions uh, too much, right? Because right now it's not particularly convenient. Uh, okay. So let's put it like this. But I mean, with the magic of Emacs, it's not that hard. Um, just a little bit of Emacs magic, you know? Just a little bit of Emacs magic. So, and after that, I multiply it by Y, which is probably saturation. So, of our nation, uh, S multiplied by that. And uh, Z is the lightness yet again. Z is the lightness and again, we use lightness in here, so uh, should be just uh, L plus that. There we go. I think I translated two lines of GLSL code uh, quite successfully, hopefully, and after that we just need to return the result. All right, so mm, I don't know, maybe it would be better to call it RGBA, like this. Does it look better? Does it look better? Probably. I don't know. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So I did a credit like from where I actually took that. I don't know. Um, because in the filters, I never actually credit that. I think I just stole that from the stack of flow or something without like even thinking. So <laughs> that was weird. But yeah. Uh, okay. Um, to, 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 to. Uh, I, I might as well actually put something like note, note uh, stolen from emote jam. Right. 
Uh, stolen from a mode jam. So now we have this thing, and I wonder if this thing is gonna even compile. We're about to find out. We're about to find out. F mod F, we don't have that. Maybe because I need to maybe import C math. Right? Let's import C math. Uh, anything else? Anything else you wanna tell me? Clamp. Uh, I think clamp is actually located in 8s here somewhere. We are not using STDM, sorry. We're only using 8s. That's what we do on this channel. That's what we do on this channel. Okay. Uh, operand have different HSL and RGB. Okay. So the question is how can you have like a white color, right? I suppose you increase the saturation and the lightness to maximum and hue doesn't really matter at that point anymore, right? So I guess... Um, I guess that's how you're gonna do that, but it would be easier to just convert it to, H, uh, to HSL, but uh, uh, HSL uh, is gonna be something like zero, but these ones are gonna be uh, like, like these ones, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Uh, and also alpha, okay, I forgot the alpha. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no matching declaration for button RGBA. Uh, debug button call. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can't fucking demo. So, RGBA. Oh, well, I mean, if it's. Uh, so, that means I probably need to go to the configuration and uh, add HSL right now. I don't want to do that. So, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to just disable this entire thing. Uh, right, at least for now. Yeah, we're gonna be just disabling this thing and uh, then we'll come back to that later. Uh, so now, uh, HSL, uh, HSLA is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna put the hue like around 25. I'm not sure if it makes anything. Uh, and then we're gonna have half of the saturation and half of the lightness, right? So, and I, I don't know what the color is going to be in this particular case, but it's gonna be some sort of a color, I guess. I know nothing about the color, so I'm just exploring things. Uh, all right, anything else? Uh, and of course, we completely forgot the uh, alpha, it's gonna be like this. Uh, okay, so here is HSLA. Uh, nice, 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 nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. So now, I want to make something a little bit brighter, right? That's what I want to do. Uh, because of that, I take the color, uh, I take the lightness, and I simply add UI highlight, uh, right, like this. Uh, boom. And of course, I'm calculating the minimum between that stuff. So basically, I got these three lines compressed into a single one. I don't have to worry about this kind of shit. Uh, so when something is activated, right, I think I wanted to make it more saturated. Uh, yep. Uh, so let's, let's do it like this. Color uh, S uh, equal color S plus UI active. Um, yeah. And let's not make it more than one. Uh -huh, so it's gonna be minimum. There we go. So, yeah, I think it, it, it looks a little bit better. We'll see how it goes. Um, let's recompile. Let's recompile. So, vars.conf uh, UI highlight. Uh, and let's say when it's active, it's gonna be something like this. Right? So, highlight just adds the lightness, uh, lightness and the active uh, adds the. Oh boy, uh, saturation. Yeah, that's what it adds. Okay, so, and when we fill the rectangle, okay, so that's precisely what I want you to see. It doesn't accept HSLA, and this is why uh, we want to convert it to RGB. There we go. Just convert it to RGB, and that's it. And we have to do that on each frame, and that's why it would be better to actually keep it in a, in a shader, right? So it would be better to convert that in the shader, but um, for now it's fine, I guess. Uh, I guess it's fine. And let's see how all of that shit looks like. I don't know, maybe it's, it's going to be completely broken, maybe it's not going to even display anything. Uh, so, and all right. Uh, huh. So I think the lightness is too big. Uh, so uh, yeah, 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 the lightness is actually too big. So we need to 
uh, make it uh, like a little bit less harsh, if you know what I'm talking about. So maybe we're going to increase it like by one and active also going to be by one. So now it becomes only a little bit brighter, right? Uh -huh. So, but the saturation could be uh, like five maybe. And yeah, the, the problem here is that the inactive button is just white so that's the problem here <laughs> so i think the inactive button should be also of the base color right it should be also of the base color but it uh, must be you know desaturated or something um okay so let me let me see Mm, you know what? What if we... Oh, this is actually super cool. Uh, what if the style of the button color is actually described in hue? Right. We only specify the hue. And saturation and lightness is already decided by the UI system. Right. So we only say here is the base color. Here is the hue. Uh, do whatever you want with it. Um, sounds good to me. I don't know. Uh, editor tool hue. Let's literally call it hue. Um, and let me... This is actually a pretty interesting idea. Uh, editor color hue. <laughs> GUI hue. Uh, and this one is going to be float. And this is going to be float. And we're simply going to return this thing. And we're simply going to return this thing. Uh, there we go. Um, that, that's a very interesting idea. I never thought about it. I would never think about that idea if I didn't implement HSLA. Trying to implement HSLA was actually a pretty good idea. Im implement. I, I stole the code from the internet. <laughs> I'm dumb. What do you want from me? I don't know how to do that. Maybe at some point I just need to sit down and like properly read about the uh, about this stuff. So <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So here's the hue. Uh, and depending on whether it's active or not, the base color, I suppose, is going to be slightly different. So if the, uh, the current editor tool is that editor tool, uh, what essentially I'm doing, I'm setting a SHLA uh, hue. We know the hue. So, and it is active. That means it's going to have a pretty, pretty good saturation, right? Pretty good saturation. Um, so let me see what's the convention for these things. Um, tool button size. Okay. Uh, so maybe it has to be something like tool button active um, uh, active saturation. So sat right, and uh, it's going to be like around. Um, I don't know, 75, I suppose. Let's let's keep it around 75. Uh, so, and this is actually a pretty big word. Button active tool. Um, button active saturation. All right, so that's nice. Uh, so this is only saturation. What about lightness? Uh, lightness could be actually standard and let's put it like around half. Uh, all right, so and the alpha is going to be like around one. So we don't want to mess with that specific thing in here, at least for now. Um, right, it's still pretty big. Hmm. Uh, HSLA. Hmm. Mm, I'm going to leave it like that. So HSLA hue uh, tool button active uh, inactive saturation uh, and the brightness is going to be this and it's going to be something like this. There we go. Mm -hmm. And when the button is inactive, uh, inactive, it's going to be around 50, I suppose. Right. Um, UI highlight, UI activate. Uh, maybe it has to be like around two. So this is sort of like the base uh, saturation for being active and active, and it's going to be modified uh, by this kind of thing, right? So and the lightness is the same for, for all of them. It's just like it's it's a matter of saturation of our nation. Oh, he said it. He said it. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, this one is a hue. Mm -mm -mm -mm. 
Do, 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 do. Okay, so if I try to uh, run this entire thing, and would you look at that? Hmm. And it's absolutely unclear which one is active currently, so... Uh, but it's, I think it's like going in, in the right direction, more or less. Uh, so let me see. So I think I'm gonna even do it like that. Uh, why am I stuck? I'm stuck. All right, so um, let me go to Vars now and let's adjust all of that. So maybe inactive saturation should be even smaller. Now we're talking, maybe active saturation should be like over the roof, essentially. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I can clearly see that inactive saturation should be like, like this. Uh, all right, now you can clearly see. Yeah, th this is actually now becomes super obvious. So what about 95? Uh -huh. And this one is going to be like around 5. Uh, cool. That's nice. Mm, maybe around 10. Um, okay, maybe active saturation should be something like this. Uh, well, if your saturation is too big, uh, like it, it can be bigger than, than one, right? So uh, because of that, uh, so activation is like 0, 2, that means the active should be like around 80 then, right? So because it doesn't make much sense. Um, uh, hmm, I don't know. Uh, it feels like highlighting. You know, maybe activation shouldn't update saturation. <laughs> I, I did that unintentionally, okay? Um, so I think maybe it should update the hue. How about we shift the hue instead of, uh, you know, updating this entire shit? Um, okay, so... Um, it's gonna be hue. And I'm not quite sure if hue needs uh, clamping. I don't think U needs clamping. Um, all right. I wanted to rebuild this entire thing. <laughs> All righty, so what do we get? Um, here's the stuff, and huh, it actually shifts the hue too much, in my opinion. I think it shifts the hue too much. Um, I need to restart everything. Huh. Uh -huh. One more time. Uh, come on, it takes too much time to build. All right, so Vars. What if the if we shift Q only like a little bit? Uh, I guess it's fine. I guess th this is fine, more or less. Uh, mm, activate the hue. Well, to be fair, increasing the situation for this thing was actually probably a better idea. Um, okay, so let's actually settle on increasing saturation. Uh, let's go back to the situation increase. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Especially in here, it kind of makes sense. Uh, all right. Okay, so um, I guess this thing is done. This thing is done. Mm -hmm. So let's do a committee committee. Mm. Mm. Um, so what am I going to do? Uh, compute UI colors based on HSLA. Right, so this is basically the commit that we did in here. So what I'm thinking that maybe we also should introduce the 3D buttonness. <laughs> 3D buttonness. Right, I want to kind of have like a similar 3D buttons as in this uh, UI thingy. I think it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. 
And since we have HS, uh, HSLA uh, color calculation, it would be super easy to like make the base um, like this because you just take the base color, make it darker and maybe less saturated. And there you go, you have your base for the button. Um, yeah, sounds like, a, sounds like a plan. Uh, should be relatively easy to implement. So I really like the idea of like just base, basically taking the base color and just tweak its saturation and value to, to fit everything. As far as I know, if you know like a color theory, maybe you can take the hue and mathematically compute the complement complementary color for the hue. But again, I'm not really um, familiar with the color theory that much to know how to do this kind of stuff. Maybe I'll need to read about that. Um, we'll see. We'll see. But maybe for now, the last thing I want to introduce here is 3D buttons, similar to how we have them in a the library. Mm -hmm. um, all right. <clears throat> so let's go in here and um, yeah. So essentially um, what we have we have the color with which we have to render everything and we need to introduce another parameter which is going to be something like uh offset right so this is going to be offset of the of the button which gives it like this distinct uh 3d look uh so by default if it's not pressed it's going to have a particular offset so let's actually put ui button uh offset uh button 3d offset let's put it this way it's going to be some sort of a 3d offset um all right and then i'm going to actually put it into the configuration here uh 3d offset and it's going to be it should be in screen coordinates let's actually in pixels i mean so let's actually put it 10 pixels all right so this is going to be that uh, and if you are active, if you are active, we should set the offset to zero, right? There is no offset if you are pressed and active. Um, okay, so after that, uh, what we're rendering in here, we're rendering the thing with offset, uh, without offset, and then on top of it with offset. So how are we going to do all of that? So this is a rectangle. Um, that means we need to construct another rectangle, I suppose, uh, a a b b position size, but with the offset. So um, I want the offset to be. Uh, let me see. Uh, so it goes to here, that means in terms of x it's negative and in terms of uh, y it's positive. Okay, so that makes sense. So it means it's going to be v2, uh, x is negative, uh, y is positive, and I'm just multiplying this entire stuff by the offset that we've got. Uh, all right, so this is the new offset uh, rectangle. Uh, cool, let's give it a try. Maybe, maybe it's going to do something. So right now we're not modifying the color of this thing, but yeah. Uh, offset. Okay, so it has to be something like V2. Mm -hmm. All right. And now they look more or less 3D-ish. Uh -huh. All right. So let me now adjust the offset. I think it should be a little bit smaller. Yeah, something something like three. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah, this gives like uh, another idea. I think the inactive should be basically unpressed, and active should be always pressed. Yeah. So if something is active, it is always pressed, and something inactive. Yeah. And because of that, uh, this thing by itself, this row of buttons, has to be its own uh, widget. Right, that keeps track of what is pressed and what unpressed, and so on and so forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so this thing definitely has to be its own, um, its own widget. We need to extract that. So, but uh, before we do that, I need to also calculate like the base base color and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so I wonder how can we easily do that. Uh, because obviously I need to construct a new color in here, but it's not particularly uh, ideal to do that. Um, all right, so here's the color. Uh, here's another thing. And 
uh -huh. So when I'm just thinking, so I can do something like H S L A uh, H color S uh, color A uh, L color A, and the thing I want to do in here, I want to make it less saturated and less bright. So it could be something like U I uh, button. Mm. Mm. I, I don't know how to come up with the name for this constant, unfortunately. I'm still thinking how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna do that. So it's gonna be minus 20, 25, right? So it has to be, maybe it's, it has to be just darker, right? So let's actually make it simply darker. Um, all right, so, well, yeah. I think it has to be applied to, to the different one. <laughs> Okay, so it has to be actually applied in here. Uh, right, so this one is going to be that. Uh, right, and this one is going to be the color. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm -hmm. There we go, now it looks 3D. And now you can even press them. They even get highlighted and stuff like that. Hmm. It's actually pretty cool. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, make the UI buttons look 3D, more or less. Uh, more or less 3D. So, and as already mentioned, I would like the um, the role of these buttons to be its own component and I'm thinking how you're gonna work with this component this is actually very interesting so essentially um, I suppose uh, you're gonna set it like this uh, tool bar and in the toolbar I I think you would actually specify the active button right so um, current tool so you have a uh, some sort of a current tool which is defined to something right and then uh, you do something like toolbar begin and you specify the, uh, the current tool right tool current uh, right and after that then you say toolbar end and this is where it ends so within this thing you would iterate for uh, tool in all tools right for tool in all tools uh, UI tool bar button right and you would specify uh, like this tool in here and here's the interesting thing starting the new toolbar will update something within the state of the UI to keep track of what is the current button and if you render this current button it's going to be rendered pressed and unpressed and of course uh, you want to do something like this if this particular button is pressed uh, the current button becomes the one that was just pressed so I want to be able to render my toolbar like this and because I provide what's the current one it should actually render the specific buttons uh, correspondingly right so some of them should be pressed and pressed and whatnot uh, so that's what I want to be able to do that's what I want to be able to do mm. hmm. so all right Let's try to do that. I think it can be very useful. Um, but we're going to do that after the small break because I need to make another cup of tea. Um, all right, let's do this. Let's literally introduce all of these methods to the UI class. Uh, so we have begin layout, and button, screen, and layout, and so on and so forth. So another thing that I want to introduce is begin to bar. Um, and I suppose. Um, we just need to um, introduce the, we just need to provide the ID of the currently pressed button, right? So, so current, um, I don't know, tool, current, there we go. Um, and then we're gonna have end to bar. Hmm. So what we're gonna have in here is essentially the button, right? So it's gonna be a uh, tool bar button and um, is it gonna we're gonna provide like the style um 
I think we do need to provide the style, right? So it's going to be similar to this one. Um, it's it's going to be literally the same one. Uh -huh. It's just going to be rendered differently depending on um, depending on whether it was pressed or not. So, but on top of that, the toolbar needs to be able to keep track of the current uh, current tool, right? So it needs to be able to keep track of it. Um, so I think we could probably store the current toolbar ID somewhere in the in the UI state, right? So, <clears throat> uh, so let's put it like this. It's going to be a um, toolbar uh, button ID. Uh, and this is where we're going to store all of that. So by default, it's going to be none. Uh, and if you start a particular um, toolbar, it actually sets this thing to that. Um, and uh, then the toolbar button will look into the toolbar button ID and if it finds itself in that toolbar button ID, it actually will uh, render itself uh, always pressed, right? So that's what's going to happen. Uh, interesting enough, um, this technically enables nested toolbars. And I think we should explicitly forbid that by uh, asserting that when you start the, uh, the toolbar, the toolbar uh, button ID is currently uh, unpressed, right? So we need to explicitly say something like that. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and implement this in the, uh, these uh, three functions. Should be pretty straightforward. Um, okay, I'm going to place them somewhere, uh, somewhere here. Right. Mm -hmm. This is going to be UI uh, to do func, uh -huh. so something like this, uh, UI, none of that is going to be used right now, right, none of that is used right now, uh, mm -hmm. and let's put it like this, let's put it like this, there we go, and this one is to do. Uh, because it's not implemented yet. Not implemented yet, but soon it's going to be implemented. Trust me. I'm a professional software developer. Uh, okay, seems to be compiled. Cool. Um, how are we going to implement all of that? So first of all, I want to actually go to here. Uh, UI begin. Right, so uh, this is where we start the entire thing. And I suppose instead of like this begin layout, I'm going to just do UI begin uh, toolbar, right? I just begin the toolbar and what I need to do, I need to provide the current toolbar. So I need to take the editor tool, right? I'm taking the editor tool and I'm statically casting it to size T because that's the ID. Might as well actually be a little bit more self-explanatory and actually cast it to UI ID, uh, which is basically an alias to size T, but at least this uh, shows the intention, right? And then here we're going to have end toolbar. There we go. So then I need to iterate through all of these things, uh, right, and just say, uh, yeah, UI tool bar button. Is it toolbar button? Yes, it is toolbar button, and it has absolutely the same signature. So yeah, nothing much needs to be changed in this code, which is beautiful. I really like that. Uh, so let's try to recompile this entire thing. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it will crash. Okay, so we didn't properly crash. Uh, could not convert. To, oh my god, this is a horrible error message. What the fuck? Uh, so isn't isn't it supposed to have like the same signature? I think it's supposed to have the same signature. Uh, what the hell are you talking about? I wish it was a little bit more readable. This is horrible. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, so from void to boolean. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Just. This is so bad. What it's trying to tell me is that I have to return boolean instead of void. Why do we have to put all of that stuff in here? My god. Ooh. Um, can you give me more relevant information than that? <laughs> Jesus Christ, C++. Like, at this point, it feels like they're doing that intentionally. There's like I literally no reason to be like that. Uh, okay, so if I enable this thing, uh, it will crash in here, so you cannot start the toolbar. Okay, so we're going to assume that the toolbars are um, essentially um, 
have implicit uh, horizontal layout, right? So we're going to do something like uh, begin layout and the layout is going to be layout kind uh, horizontal. There we go. So also I forgot that we need to assert that the toolbar button ID is uh, doesn't have any value, right? So if it does have value, that means you're trying to build a nested toolbars, which is not allowed, right? Um, so let's actually put something like this in here. Nested toolbars are not allowed, sorry. There we go. So, and after that, I want to do something like toolbar button ID should be equal to some uh, tool current. There we go. Uh, and let's just uh, remove this thing. And now, and now we have this stuff. All right. So what's going to be the next thing? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, we also have to provide the padding, I suppose. Um, mm, we can provide the padding somewhere here. Uh, I don't know, maybe it should have some sort of its own padding, but do you want to customize it? Eh, eh. Okay, let's provide the padding in here. Why not? Why not? Sure. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what I want you to do, I want you to go to HPP, uh, begin toolbar, and I want you to put the padding in here. There we go. So now we have a padding. Is, is there anything else you want to tell us? Uh, and here we're going to have tools. Uh, panel padding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, looks good to me. Anything, anything, anything wrong with that? Pretty straightforward. Mm, okay, now it crashes a toolbar button. Perfect. So toolbar button is essentially just a button, right? It's the same as this thing, except it's always uh, rendered as pressed, right? It is always rendered as pressed. So maybe some of this like code for rendering buttons and maybe keeping track of hot, not hot things could be extracted to a separate thing. Um, so that would be actually kind of convenient. Um, so at least I want to extract this thing because yeah, it's going to be super useful. We could have had, uh, we could have had some function called render button. Uh, right, UI HPP. So it's going to be something like here. So we have a layout stuff. Here we have a uh, render button. And to render a button, it will accept the renderer, obviously. Renderer. Uh, renderer. The atlas. Uh, atlas. Um, also, it should accept, I suppose, AABB, right? Because it's just rendering the button without all of the layout bullshit. All of the layout bullshit is done within these functions. This is just pure rendering of the button, nothing special. So uh, this is the rectangle. Um, and then we have something like HSLA back color uh, and HSLA front color. Um, front color um, right do we want to have an offset a button offset um, I'm not sure eh, to be fair we can just have a color right so and again all of that is computed based on the on the color in here so and it's gonna be HSLA color uh, so and when we're trying to render this entire thing so where is the begin uh, I'm gonna put it in here so UI uh, render this entire thing oh and also yeah well, quite important thing is it pressed or not uh, pressed uh, it's gonna be false by default and we're gonna have something like boolean pressed there we go uh, so now I'm gonna grab the code responsible for rendering the baton le baton uh, right, and I'm gonna put it in here. So here is the le baton. Um, okay, and the offset, uh, what offset is competed by? Uh, UI, oh, we even have UI button 3D offset, sure. Uh, which we can straight up put in here. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Float offset. If it's not, if it's pressed, it's going to be zero. Right, if it's not pressed, it's going to be UI 3D offset and it's going to be a, a constant in here and so on and so forth. So uh, here we have color, uh, right, and we are updating, yeah, here's where we're updating all of that color and stuff like that. I guess that is it. 
uh, I think that's the entire thing. We finally extracted it. Um, all right. Uh, so and this has to be a semicolon. Where is my T? Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so here's the position. So the position is essentially the rect position and this is the rect size. Mm -hmm. So I want to basically extract this entire logic somewhere. Um, all right, cool. So and now in the button, right, in the button, when I'm trying to render the button, I'm not going to be doing this. Uh, I'm going to be trying to do uh, like just a render button, right? A render uh, button. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So it's going to get the renderer, uh, render the atlas. Uh, atlas, uh, then the rectangle. We do have a rectangle and we do have a collar, right? We do have a collar. And whether it's pressed or not, determined by the offset. So uh, we have click, uh, we probably need to do something like pressed. So by default is false, but when you set the offset to zero, that means it's pressed now. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. So offset, oh yeah, there we go, we don't have to do that. And here is pressed. Uh, eh, Emacs. Cool. So we can do shit like that. Okay. Uh, it is in fact pressed. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to be able to extract this into a separate thing. Right. So essentially, I want it to be a function that just accepts my ID. And it returns us the like different things where whether it's generated a uh, click, whether it's pressed, uh, whether it's something else and whatnot, whether it's like hot and active or some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder what needs to be done. So we're when we are active, we are modifying our own color. Uh, when we're hot, we're also modifying our own color. Um, so, I guess it would be cool. Yeah, there's a lot of things that needs to be handled in here. Like, it's kind of difficult to uh, extract all of that stuff. So, but this would be also nice. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So, it's sort of like, if it was a function, it would return some sort of enumeration. Uh, that sort of tells us what's the current state. Are we active? Are we um, are we inactive? Are we hot? Are we active? Are we uh, pressed by basically switching to inactive? And based on these things, uh, we could basically adjust our look and feel. That would be rather interesting, I think. Uh, that would be rather interesting. <clears throat> So, and what such enumeration would even look like? Let's see. Um, enumeration, something like uh, enum class state, uh, right. And it could be inactive, right? This one could be also something like size t. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter because I'm not planning to use it as an index or ID or anything like that. Inactive, inactive, uh, hot, active, um, uh, clicked, right? Uh, clicked. Mm. So yeah, because there's like sort of four phases through which the widget goes: being inactive, being hot, uh, being active, currently active. We're currently pressing it, and then being clicked, meaning that like it was uh, unpressed. And if it's some other widget, for example, editor field. I guess it was switch the focus or something, but this kind of stuff needs to be. Um, I, I'm still thinking how should we call this because it's not really clicked. It's more of a activated, right? Because as you press the button, it's not activated yet, uh, right? It's not activated yet, but it's about to to do that. Um, maybe it should be something like fired, right? So inactive hot 
active and then fired and this is where you do the action if it's a button you click something if it's like editor field you, you apply the changes that we made to the editor field or something like that i'm not sure if that's a good idea uh but i, I kind of really want to extract that logic to somewhere but maybe it's something that difficult to extract generally so um i'm not sure uh we can give it a try we can give it a try <clears throat> so and how how the function would even look like uh, something like update state right so and here you would provide the id uh, of the widget right and it will give you the state right update state um, right and then depending on the state whether you whether you are inactive hot or active or fired you would do different things okay so let me see if we can do something about that mm -hmm. So I'm going to put it in here, uh, UI update state, uh, right? And um, where is the button? Here it is. This is where we're trying to do all of that stuff, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So, and we can have something like state, uh, state equal, initially it can, it can be equal to uh, inactive, right? So it is initially inactive, and then we just return this entire thing. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Okay. So if you are active, uh, oh shit, and you also need to have a particular size, right? So you um, you need to have a rectangle. All right. So that means we need to apply a a b b in here. So it's going to be something like float uh, rectangle. So that requires this kind of thing. Uh, update state. Um, a a b b float rect all right so if we are active so we don't care about these things right we don't care about these things uh and the mouse button is pressed uh we become inactive and if the mouse position is contained within the, this thing we become actually fired right so state fired there we go we fired um Hmm, it's actually kind of cool. So that means if you unpressed it being outside of that thing, uh, being outside, you uh, essentially switch from active to inactive without firing. That's cool. I like that. Uh, okay, so when you are hot and the uh, mouse position within the rectangle, you basically become inactive again. You, you don't do anything, right? So that, that makes sense. Um, you just stay inactive. Mm -mm, mm -hmm. So you go hot, and then you become inactive. So that means this condition becomes useless, uh, and uh, I don't even know what to do in that case, though. <laughs> All right. So uh, if you are hot. Uh, if you are hot and uh, um, <clears throat> the mouse button is pressed and nobody is active, right? Uh, so that's basically what the condition was all about. So it means you are inside of this thing. If you are inside of this stuff, right? If you are inside of this stuff uh, and the mouse button is pressed and nobody else is active, you become active, you become active and the state becomes um uh state becomes active as well right state becomes active uh all right if you're not active not hot that and um nobody is active and you are inside of this thing uh you become hot and the state becomes uh -huh, state becomes hot and then you just return this entire thing so this is how i'm trying to Sort of update this entire logic, right? So update the state. Mm -hmm. So and something like button would update its state, then it would look at its uh, the numeration, and depending on whether it's an active active, it would just render itself uh, differently, right? So I think that makes sense. Um, hopefully, I didn't screw up too much. Mm. So and let me let me see. So that means I should be able to remove this entire shit completely. Uh, I should be able to remove this entire shit. 
uh, and maybe even this entire shit. We'll see. We'll see. But maybe click is uh, something that that needs to be tracked off. Uh, click false. All right. So in here, I can do switch uh, update state, update state of my own ID. Uh, and I provide the rectangle of the widget, right? So, and depending on uh, the enumeration that got returned in here, uh, right, I will have to do different things. So, let me copy paste this entire stuff uh, like this, and it's gonna be state. And also, I'm gonna put a case in here, uh, and we're gonna query, query replace this thing with that stuff, right? So, and the default case should be unreachable. Uh, unreachable uh, funk. There we go. Mm, so if you are inactive, if you are inactive, you just render yourself uh, with the particular color, right? Uh, with the base color, I suppose. Yeah, you just render yourself with the base color. And after that, you just push the size of the widget, right? You just push the size of the widgets and that's it. And you don't even generate any click, right? So, all right, that makes sense, I suppose. Uh, maybe because of that, since we're gonna just return uh, out of the function right away, we don't need this stuff anymore and we don't need this stuff anymore. Uh, and everything here is unreachable, must be unreachable. Okay, if we're hot, if we're hot, uh, we need to render the button as usual with the renderer, with the atlas, with the rectangle, uh, with the particular color. And by, by the way, we are not pressed, right? We are not pressed. And the color needs to be updated. It's going to be HSLA, color H, color um, mm, HSL. And I remember that we need to use UI highlight, right? So it's going to be UI highlight. There we go. And then we're going to use color A. Cool. Uh, color A. And button is still unpressed. Button is still unpressed. And here, uh, we're going to do it like that. If it is active, though, if it is active, uh, we have to do active and we have to make the button pressed there we go but we still return false uh, if we fired if we fired that means we i suppose need to render it as normal we render it as, as normal but uh, we're generating a click that you can then use to you know to, to other stuff i think it's a little bit more straightforward even though there's like a bunch of copy paste uh i, I still like it a little bit more so though so this kind of stuff could be done like this so it's going to be color uh, l plus ui highlight right ui highlight and just remove that and then i can just put the color in here that's it so that's that's a little bit better i don't know why i'm uh over complicating this stuff so it's gonna be like that and it's going to be color. Uh, look at that. So you, you can clearly see, right, right, different situations. Inactive, hot, active, fired. Um, and depending on this stuff, we just update the style slightly differently. And that's precisely what I wanted to have in here. Um, all right, that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's try to compile this stuff. And now I can reuse the same code for the toolbar button, right? So, uh, because it's kind of similar, but it just reacts differently on different state updates, right? It just reacts differently on different state updates. And the entire state updates, like, uh, you know, mess uh, state updates spaghetti is sort of tucked under this function. Uh, but this is, this actually implies the button behavior, the behavior that allows you to cancel the, the, uh, the click but I mean, it, quite often you want to just be able to cancel the click. So I didn't see any problems with that. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, maybe we're going to have different kinds of updates that behave differently. So it's, it's going to be like, you know, um, this is a, maybe this is a behavior, uh, right? So maybe it has to be like a button behavior. Uh, yeah, this is actually kind of cool. So one is button rendering and another one is button behavior. And you can actually mesh different renderings and behaviors. 
uh, yeah, this is a behavior essentially. So I need to keep that in mind to, to rename this thing to behavior or something like that. Anyway, let's actually try to, uh, to compile this entire thing and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, state uh, does not have an, a main time. Okay, so let's actually rebuild this entire stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, all right, so and if I do that, it uh, fails here. Okay, let's try to implement toolbar button now. Uh, right, so we need to grab the layout, uh, top layout, and we need to assert that it, it does in fact exist, right? So it shouldn't be equal to null. That means you forgot to put it inside of layout. Um, <clears throat> so can't uh, render toolbar button outside of any layout. All right, so maybe it makes sense to actually put some sort of a message in here, right, to explain what the hell has happened. Uh, right, so it's going to be like this. Can't render uh, a button outside of any layout. Uh, all right, so now we also need to grab the position. So. Um, so const out uh, position, it's not post, it's a position. We take the layout, we grab the available position, uh, and then we need to construct the rectangle. So it's going to be AABB, position and size. Uh, all right, I think we want to unpack all of these arguments because we're going we're gonna to start using them. Uh, so this is going to be the size, this is going to be the ID, and so on and so forth. All right, so after that, I need to update my state. So I need to switch between uh, different states in here. So it's going to be ID, and here's the rectangle, and let's see what's going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> if you're inactive, um, yeah, let, let me copy paste uh, all of this stuff. Uh, all of these things. Um, it's going to be something like that, uh, and we want to. Do something like this case state uh -huh. and we're gonna return actually either true or false or something uh, right and then the default one is going to be essentially unreachable uh, for this specific function okay <clears throat> so when you are inactive when you are inactive but, but, hmm, we should also probably do the following thing. Let's assert that the tool uh, bar button ID has a value, right? And if it doesn't have a value, we're going to say uh, can't render a tool bar button outside of uh, the tool bar, right? So, yeah, uh, it's quite important. So if we are inactive, uh, we're going to render le baton. Uh, let's actually copy this entire thing. So we're going to be just copy pasting all that. So here's the color. And here's the interesting thing. Whether it's pressed or unpressed will be determined by uh, whether it is the currently selected button of the toolbar, if you know what I mean. So it's going to be ID equal to the toolbar uh, button ID. If it is equal, it's going to be pressed, even if it's inactive. That's kind of the point of this entire thing. Uh, right, so when it's hot, when it's hot, I feel like, actually, we can essentially copy-paste this entire thing. We can copy-paste this entire thing and just add this condition to each individual thing in here. Okay, so that makes sense, probably. Uh, all right, so if you are inactive, it just depends on whether you pressed or not. Maybe we can actually keep it like this. Uh, pressed uh, ID equal to toolbar uh, button ID. Right, and we're going to put pressed in here. Uh, if it's highlighted, it's going to be pressed like this. Um, if it's active, I guess it's always going to be pressed regardless of whether it's active or not. And if it's fired, uh, right, it's going to be something like this. Yeah, there we go. So it's basically like button. It is essentially like button, but with an additional thing in here. All right. So I wonder if it's going to work. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. Let's recompile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, oh, this one has to be some. 
Well, I mean, we have an uh, interesting assertion, right? So we know for a fact that toolbar button has at least something, right? So that means I can quite easily just uh, unwrap it, right? Simply unwrap it. Um, and don't worry about that. As far as I know, uh, we can do something like uh, unwrap or panic. Uh, and then, yeah, we can do it like this. Uh, unfortunately, unwrap or panic doesn't really tell us where it happens. So yeah, uh, we'll probably need to update the unwrap or panic thingy to actually tell us the place. In a similar way how uh, to do and unreachable tell us also where where all that happens. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, anyway, so this one has to be some. Mm -hmm. mm -mm -mm. Okay, and now it fails at end toolbar. So if we want to end the toolbar, we actually need to reset toolbar uh button id it doesn't have a value anymore right and then we're gonna actually end the layout in here because we implicitly edit layout when we started the toolbar right here you see and then we set the button and now we have to do the same things but in the opposite order um so yeah it should be it now and let's see if, if it's working let's see if it's working <laughs> and it is Interestingly enough, when I'm holding on it, it doesn't really press. So I suppose I would expect it to be always active. Um, but it's just not. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, probably. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I see. Um, that's quite important. If you are active, you are active, right? Uh, if you are hot, you are hot, right? <laughs> and then if something th like this happens, you become active. Only then you become active. Uh, and uh, here, uh, you initially inactive, right? So state is going to be state uh, inactive. Uh, I wonder if I can actually... This is a very complicated logic, all right? So can we simplify this entire stuff, all right? Simplify this entire stuff. For instance, like getting several returns, if you know what I mean. Just have several returns. Mm, so it's just basically like logic with different paths and whatnot. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to go into that, but it would be actually useful because then the control for analysis of the compiler will tell us if we forgot something, all right? So... Nice. Uh, it kind of, yeah, works more or less well. It like for a single frame, it sort of like jumps around or something. But I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so what we can do in here, I think, uh, if we encounter this thing, we're gonna just return state uh, fired, right? Um, <laughs> Mm, all right, if button, and then here you're going to return state uh, inactive, right? But if you reach that, you're going to return state active. Uh, yeah. Hmm, this is actually very interesting. So you're active, then mouse button is unpressed, you become inactive, right? You simply become inactive. Uh, Right, and then if you were inside of this thing, you're gonna be fired, otherwise, you're gonna become inactive. Uh, all right, so maybe it would be even better to do it like that. Uh, if the mouse button is pressed, you just stay active, you just always stay active. I'm not sure if I want to keep it like that, so I'm just thinking what's gonna be easier to read. Um, all right, so in here, I can just simply uh, return active, but otherwise I'm going to simply return hot. Right, we didn't become um, you know inactive or anything. It's just going to be all right. Um, so in here um, we became hot. We became hot, and if we uh, went through that, we're going to become inactive. 
Right, so it's a little bit more spaghettish, but at least now the compiler have an opportunity to check control flow and see if we didn't forget all of the paths. Right, so it's a little bit more straightforward for the compiler, in my opinion. Um, so it jumps for a single frame when I unpress it. It's rather interesting. So if I fire it, uh, so tool bar button, right? Uh, where is it? Where is it? So it really does unpressed for, for a single frame. And I'm still thinking why though? Why does it do that? Um, <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. But overall, I guess it is working fine. It is in fact working fine. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe it's fine. Yeah, yeah. When I unpress it, it gets fired. Uh, it gets fired. Uh, but fire should be actually pressed right fire should be uh, actually pressed um yeah maybe i should always make fire pressed uh and let's see if it's gonna if it's gonna fix the problem um it actually fixed it okay so yeah so there is no uh, yeah that's perfect uh that's cool. So now you can see that something is currently pressed and then, yeah. So what if we add more buttons in there? Um, <clears throat> how about that? Um, num, 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 num. Uh, so if we have debug buttons, if they're enabled, let's actually begin a toolbar and then end the toolbar in here, right? And instead of button, we're gonna use tool uh, bar button. Uh, I really like that button and toolbar button actually have the same signature. It makes it easier to refactor like this. Um, so, but we also need to keep track of the uh, of the current button in there, like a current debug button. Uh, also, when I start the begin toolbar, it on it needs the current ID and uh, the padding. So here I need to provide some sort of a current ID. So. Uh, debug button so let's call it debug button and if um, hmm, this one is rather interesting mm, debug button ID debug button ID uh, if this thing is pressed uh, debug button is going to be equal to this thing all right uh, so now we need to add this button somewhere. Uh, we're gonna uh, put it in here, I suppose. So it's gonna say st debug button, right? So here is the debug button, and I suppose by default it has to be equal to something, but I'm not sure what it has to be equal to. So let's just see how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we need to enable all of the buttons in here. So I'm gonna. Just go to true or false. Where is the false? I'm gonna make it true. And that didn't enable anything. What the fuck? Uh, all right, it didn't work at all. Thank you so much. Uh, it didn't render anything at all. What the fuck? It's supposed to render something. Disgusting. Oh, because I, I, I disabled it. Okay, so I explicitly disabled it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's let's try to recompile this entire thing. And of course, yeah, th that's actually quite surprising that it compiled so easily. Um, so here is an ID, debug button, no matching function. Okay, so this is RGBA and, um, okay, HSLA um, 69, right? And it's gonna be half of that, half of that and full that. And of course, I forgot to make them floats, right? They have to be floats. Um, cool, 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 cool. 
Mm -hmm. So let me take a look. Here are the buttons and I can switch between them. So it's kind of funny how the color is actually almost like a background. So maybe I should call them slightly differently. Uh, so it's not going to be 69, but maybe it's going to be 42. How about 42? So just to see that they're slightly different. Um, mm, yeah, well, that looks a little bit better. And as you can see, you can switch between those things. Cool. Uh, this thing allows me to create enemies, this thing allows me to create that, and this is like purely uh, this stuff. Uh, Alright, and that's actually pretty cool. Why is it... Oh. Oh. The hot getting stuck. Getting stuck. Uh, so let's quickly fix that as well. Uh, at least I have a centralized place where I have to fix all of this, right? So... Um, if you're hot, all right, if you're hot uh, and the mouse is, con okay, I see, the thing is not contained within this, within this entire stuff, right, um, you're not hot anymore, right, uh -huh. so hot ID has value, false, and you become inactive essentially. Uh, right, to become inactive. Uh, cool. Mm, then, if you are, if it is contained there and the mouse button is pressed, you become active. Otherwise, you stay, you stay hot. All right. So I guess that's basically what we need in here. At least it now it's centralized and it can be reused for several components. Right. It it is a mess, but it it's a centralized mess. Yeah. Now it works. Perfect. Uh, cool. So we have a bunch of these things that are pressable and pressable and stuff like that. So, uh, yep, 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 yep. So we implemented the toolbar, right? So maybe I'm going to actually uh, create a separate branch in here. So it's going to be a uh, tool, um, UI toolbar, UI toolbar. And uh, let's actually do it like this. Mm -mm. Implement uh, UI to bar right and i'm going to push that right at the repo so i have a couple of like branches that are sort of stacked on top of each other and this is because i forgot to merge this one so let's actually first uh, merge ui highlight uh and then uh, uh rebase everything accordingly so this is going to be ui highlight uh yep 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 yep, yep. Mm, and uh, it doesn't build on a lot of places. I wonder why, uh, what has happened. Uh, it's also trying to rebuild something. Is it because of CI yet again? Don't tell me that it's because of CI or something. Uh, okay, so building the game uh, and... Oh, okay. Fatal, no such... Wait, what, how, how does it work then? I don't understand. Excuse me. Uh, all right, so let's do build sh. It builds on my machine, for sure. Oh, maybe something release. Yeah, I forgot to check release. That's right. Let's let's check release. I forgot to check release. That's important. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alrighty. Yeah, release actually takes a, a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. <laughs> so, uh, fix, release, build. So, our git history gets a little bit crazier now. Right, so it, it starts to diverge a little bit. Uh, but, yeah. So let's just wait for the rest of the things. We can always just go to UI toolbar because we never actually pushed it. So it should be relatively straightforward to rebase it uh, on top of the UI highlight. And that didn't even cause any merge conflict. So it's totally fine. Uh, so once we merge this thing, we're going to merge it on top. And yeah, should be fine. <laughs> All righty. So I guess we're going to wait for the continuous integration and after continuous integration is done, uh, we're going to uh, continue working on this thing. All right, so let's merge this thing. Mm, super quick. 
Uh, and uh, let me go to the master and fetch the latest stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alright, so and that means um, we can remove this stuff and go in here and rebase it on top of the master, right? And just push that right into the repo. Uh, and yeah, make another pull request. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's make another pull request. Uh, implement UI toolbar. There we go. So, and the next thing I wanted to implement after the toolbar, I want to be able to have labels in our UI. You see how um, uh, I want to be able to just describe, okay, these are the level editor tools, right? So these are something got broken. Is this like a previous version? It could be actually previous version. Yeah, okay, so I didn't rebuild it. Uh, yeah, I actually switched back and uh, now it's, it's an old one. Yeah, I want to be able to actually put some sort of a label in front of the toolbar saying, okay, this is like tools and uh, in front of the debug one saying that this is the debug things. All right, so yeah. That's that can be the idea in here, uh, right? And if I do something like this, uh, there we go. And in front of here, I want to have a debug. And this thing could be also its own like label and whatnot. It's kind of funny how the cursor is actually rendered behind this thing. So yeah, we'll probably have to fix that. <clears throat> so yeah, the next thing is going to be actually labels. And then we can think about another thing. What if the uh, buttons themselves could have uh, labels? Uh, that way we don't really need icons, we could just put some labels in here uh, with the text saying that this is like tile, uh, this is an enemy, and maybe we're going to add another button in here saying something like um, item. As you can see, we, we have items, but you cannot create them through, through the level editor, but maybe we're going to enable user to do that. So yeah, the possibilities are endless. My god. Right, let's merge this thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's delete the branch. Naizu, uh, naizu, naizu, naizu. Uh, okay, so let me go to here now. <sighs> and uh, merge the origin master. So last branch, UI label. Let's quickly do the layout, UI label. I think it should be actually pretty straightforward. The cool thing about labels is that there are not interactive elements. That means uh, you, they don't need IDs. They don't need IDs and they don't need this behavior logic of hot, not hot or anything. They're just there, right? Uh, but they do update the layout. They do add themselves to the layout. So they are easy to implement, but they still need to be integrated into the, the actual UI. Uh, let's actually see how we can do that. Uh, UI HPP. And uh, here we have a button and I want to introduce something like a label. Uh, so in rendering labels, usually done through a font, right? So you have to provide the font. Mm, 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 mm. So, and because of that, we only need to provide the uh, renderer and the font. Um, I think that should be enough. So we know the position, we know the scale. Uh, yeah, we also need to provide the color and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks good. So we provide the renderer, uh, right, here's the renderer, and we provide the font. Uh, so then uh, we need to provide the text. Uh, so I'm going to provide only a, a string view because it's easy to con convert sister into string view, but not the other way around. Uh, the position doesn't matter. Scale does, in fact, matter. Uh, and also the color. Mm. So the color also going to be AHSL. Uh, to be fair, uh, it could be RGB as well. Eh, I don't know. Uh, we're going to use HSL for all of the UI stuff. Uh, there we go. So this is what we need in here. So luckily we can easily compute the size of the text by the amount of characters in the text. So it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and also knowing the scale. It's also based on scale. Uh, let's implement this thing. Mm, so where is the Lebatone? Here is the Lebatone. 
uh, UI renderer. There we go. And label doesn't have to return boolean. I don't know what I was thinking about, but it doesn't really need to return the, the boolean. Okay, so uh, label also located in the layout, right? So that means we need to get the layout. Um, so let me copy paste some of this code in here. Uh, might as well actually do something like this. Right. So we get the layout, we get the available position and the rectangle depends on the size and the size in fact is something that can be computed from the font itself, right? So this is the text size. Uh -huh. So and then we just do it like that. Text size. Length is the amount of characters. So uh, I need to do something like this count. Scale is available and there we go. We know the size of the text. We can compute the rectangle. Uh, then the next thing we need to do probably is render the text. So it's going to be font, render text, given the renderer, then the text itself, then the position, then the scale, and uh, the color as well. So the color needs to be converted to RGBA. Right, so we render this entire thing. Add, uh, uh, after that, we need to add the, um, the text label to the layout. Right, so we need to do layout push widget size. Uh, and the size is computed based on the amount of characters and the scale. That should be it, believe it or not. This is literally it. Uh, okay, let's try to comp uh, compile this entire thing. Uh, this is not how we compile it, of course. Uh, let's rebuild it. And it doesn't even compile. Okay, so uh, it's a part of the font, of course. Okay, so, and we don't even have a rect, so we don't even need it. Thank you, compiler, for telling me that. Mm, render a label outside of any layout. Mm, that should be it. Like, literally, you just render it, you take the available position, you render yourself there, and then you tell the layout how big you were, so the lay layout can accommodate, uh, you know, your, your widget. Um, okay, so let's go to the game, uh, and in here, uh, here we have a toolbar. Right, so this is a vertical layout. And I suppose we're gonna have label and then the toolbar. So that means they need to be wrapped into horizontal layout, right? So uh, this entire thing needs to be wrapped into begin layout, right? Then UI layout kind uh, horizontal, right? So this is where it starts. Then uh, this is roughly where it ends. And then we say uh, end layout, something like this, right? So this is the horizontal layout. Then we start the toolbar. Toolbar starts yet another horizontal layout on its own. And then within that thing, we render the buttons. And now we want to say something like uh, UI uh, label, right? So we're going to have a UI label. Uh, you uh, e emacs okay uh label ui hpp ui hpp so we're gonna have the renderer right so this is gonna be the renderer uh the font we do have the font but i think we'll have to actually pass all of that by a pointer uh the text um label label by the way label label uh the text is gonna be what um i don't know Editor, let's call it editor. The color is HSLA. Um, I don't know, let's use uh, 25, uh, half, half, uh, one. Maybe I need to create like a special constructor for this HSL thingy, but I don't know. Um, so I can, I can use probably the debug text scale. Um, so where is the vars? Debug text scale it's around like five uh let's let me hard code this entire thing all right so that should work now uh let's see if it if it does let's see if it does and it exited abnormally because it didn't properly compile because you also need to specify the padding do we want to have any padding between those things we can put some padding but let's actually put uh, zero in here just just in case uh, two, 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 two. All right. Uh, what else do you want from me? Uh, uh, no matching function to call HSL float. Um, oh, let's go through all of that stuff. I probably forgot some of the arguments. Uh, so the first one is the renderer font uh, text. Oh, text has to be like SV. Uh, what, what a useful compiler. 
my gut. Uh, right, is it gonna work now? Nice. So, and we are about to reveal that it worked or not. Kind of worked. So, but it looks prepared as fuck. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it kind of did work. So now we have a label. So there's something wrong with like uh, padding and whatnot. Mm, so I think this is how the padding is handled by the layout itself. Right, and we, we can do a similar thing for the uh, for the debug buttons, right? If the debug button's enabled, we also begin the layout, uh, which is essentially UI layout, uh, not label, layout, please, Emacs, layout uh, kind uh, horizontal, right? So the padding is gonna be zero, we don't have any padding in here. Uh, I'm gonna put some scope in here just in case. Uh, and UI and layout, uh, there we go. So we have something like this. Then we're gonna have a label uh, and in here, mm, we're gonna put it in here and this is gonna be debug, right? So yeah, so I really like how the code itself looks like a you know UI tree, but it's not really tree, it's more like immediate handling of this stuff. Uh, all right, so let me see if it's gonna work now. Mm, okay, and it didn't work. I'm super happy. Yay! What the fuck has happened? Why? Why didn't? Is out. Oh, this is because I never actually rebuilt it. All right. I knew that the fast building was kind of sus. Uh, it was kind of sus. Not gonna lie. There we go. So you have a debug, and you have an editor. Nice. Very very cool. Uh, very very cool. So I, I wonder if I can just add a bunch of spaces to actually make them equal in sizes. So how many characters you have? Seven characters and here you have uh, eight characters. So we can add additional space and they're gonna be sort of aligned. And I don't like this color so let's put something like 30 in here and 30 in here. So maybe it's gonna be slightly different. We, we can probably adjust that in a debug configuration, but we don't support HSLA, so it's not gonna be very, it's even worse, but I mean, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, all right. Uh -huh. Yeah, it looks all right. So I just wanna put some sort of background. So here you can create uh, enemies. Uh, this is the editor that can add things. And these are the debug buttons, uh, right? And it does make sense. I wonder why, why there is so such a huge padding in here. I suppose because the padding is handled in a really strange way. Uh, even though like I put the padding uh, equal to zero there. So, eh. yeah. But anyway, so we implemented pretty, you know, pretty cool thing today, right? So um, we made the buttons more interactive. They are, they look like buttons now. Uh, they do in fact look like buttons and <clears throat> uh, we also implemented HSL coloring, we uh, improved the layout, edit labels and stuff like that and it's gonna get more complicated from there. It's actually gonna become more and more complicated over time. So yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, I'm just thinking how I'm gonna... Is, it, is this a good uh, thumbnail? Maybe. I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it is not. <clears throat> so yeah, anyway, that's it for the day. Thanks everyone who's watching me right now. Really appreciate it. Uh, check out all the links in the description. Uh, I put some interesting stuff for you if you're interested in the in the stuff I'm doing. Uh, have a good one and I see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow we're gonna be doing a web development, I think. Tomorrow is Monday. Uh, yeah, and Monday is a web development. So I see you all tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, love you. Mwah.